how much is a rope worth? Or how important is a knife? Or a match? Or a single spare part? The answer is, it all depends. How important is a blowout preventer control system? Well, the answer is, it all depends. Actually, blowout preventer controls that are too small for the job, ones that are undersized, can be worthless. But with men's lives at stake and millions of dollars worth of equipment, there's just one way to play it, right. The right sized unit for the rig. During the next few minutes, we'll rediscover the basic concepts behind the accumulator unit and discuss the principles and components, the sizing, maintenance, and some do's and don'ts on blowout preventer controls. One of the most important of these items is sizing. There's just no way for an undersized accumulator unit to do the job of one that is properly sized. The fact that you know this right now puts you ahead of most people. Later you'll learn how to size a unit and then you'll be at the head of an elite group. By the way, some people call an accumulator a closing unit, which is all right, but really there is a difference. A closing unit is a way of closing the rams on a blowout preventer, while an accumulator stores hydraulic fluid under pressure for closing the preventers. The original closing unit was nothing more than a valve actuated by a hand-operated wheel. If the chain was well-oiled and not rusty or clogged, they'd work all right. And if the threads were clean, and if there were no cuttings or sand in the preventers, hand wheels could close the ram in around a minute and a half to two minutes. Occasionally, however, hand closing units would take up to 25 minutes to close, and during a slow closing, high pressure gas or sand could damage the ram faces, making them practically useless. One step forward from the old hand closing units was the use of pumps to close the rams. Sometimes mud pressure directly from the pumps was used. But this isn't really suitable, so it became clear that hydraulic fluid was the thing to use. This old timer was first put into service in the early 50s. Notice that it's a closing unit, not an accumulator. It's just a pump and a tank of hydraulic fluid. No fluid is accumulated under pressure. The fluid was pumped to the blowout preventer stack with sufficient pressure to close the rams. There are many drawbacks to the old time simple unit. The main disadvantage is that a pump that is able to deliver both the pressure and the volume needed is either too large, too expensive, or both. A modern accumulator simply accumulates hydraulic fluid under pressure for use in closing the rams in only a matter of seconds. In some ways, the accumulator is a lot like a storage battery that accumulates energy and holds it until there's a need for it. The basic concept of an accumulator is that nitrogen pressure, gas pressure, is built up in a tank or chamber as it left. The hydraulic fluid is forced into this same chamber, increasing the pressure as it center. Then when the hydraulic fluid is needed to operate the rams, a valve is opened and compressed nitrogen forces the hydraulic fluid out as at right. You don't have to look very long to see that this basic system needs some polish. For instance, there needs to be some sort of stopping device to shut off the nitrogen to keep it from following the fluid into the lines. And two, some sort of working pressures need to be established. As for working pressures, 1,200 PSI is the minimum pressure needed to close an annular preventer on open hole. And since annular preventers can be damaged at anything over 1,500 PSI, the working limits of the accumulator were pretty well set, that is, from 1,200 to 1,500 PSI. Since 1,500 PSI is the upper limit, it seems reasonable, as at A, to precharge the chamber with half that amount of nitrogen or 750 PSI. Then as at B, enough hydraulic fluid is pumped in to bring the pressure to 1200 PSI. At C, the fluid level is increased until the pressure reaches 1500 PSI, 
the maximum allowable to avoid damage to the annular preventer. For a while, this 1500 PSI accumulator was considered quite the thing, but it has a limitation. Note at left that it takes about 30 gallons of fluid to bring the pressure to 1200 PSI. At right, you can see that only 10 more gallons are needed to bring the pressure up to 1500 PSI. This means that there is only 10 gallons of working fluid. In other words, there's only 10 gallons of fluid available for use before the pressure drops to the 1200 PSI minimum. Only 10 gallons of usable fluid out of an 80 gallon ball. Surely there must be a better way. What would you do to improve this system? Well, the first thing you might think of is to raise the precharge pressure. Before, we had 750 PSI. Let's see what happens if we increase that pressure to 1,000 PSI. At A, a ball that has the proper working pressure to be able to safely withstand higher pressures is precharged to 1,000 PSI. At B, fluid is pumped into the ball and it reaches the 1,200 PSI minimum pressure sooner. At C, more fluid is forced into the ball until the pressure reaches 3,000 PSI. Notice now that there's 40 gallons of usable fluid. Now that's more like it. This is called a 3,000 PSI accumulator. Right now you're probably wondering why 3,000 PSI doesn't damage the preventer because earlier we said that pressure in excess of 1,500 PSI could damage the annular preventer. Well, the 3,000 PSI system is built with a pressure reducing and regulating valve that handles this higher pressure and provides enough volume to operate the rams. The pressure is regulated down to an acceptable 1,500 PSI. When we looked at this basic setup earlier, we said that working pressures needed to be established and that we have done. But we also said that fluid had to be retained in the vessel so that hydraulic pressure would be maintained. So the question now is how do we tell the bottle or ball not to let the fluid pass out? Here are two guided float accumulators. The ball accumulator on the left has at number one to the right on the ball an entrance for the nitrogen precharge. At two the port for the hydraulic fluid. At three, a poppet valve that's closed by the weight of the float. And four is the float itself. This type of accumulator ball was the first offshoot of the original basic concept. While these are still manufactured due to their relatively low cost, they do have a serious built-in weakness. They permit the nitrogen and fluid to come into direct contact with each other and even though nitrogen is not highly soluble, some does become entrained in the hydraulic fluid. This means that nitrogen is lost and consequently effectiveness of the accumulator is lost as well. Nitrogen loss can be devastating. It's like taking a step backward to the times when lower pressure accumulators were used. When nitrogen pressure is lost, usable fluid is lost as well. To overcome the weaknesses of a guided float accumulator, the bottle type separator accumulator was developed. Although balls are available, bottles are most often used because they are smaller, lighter, and take up less space. Instead of a float, this accumulator has a bladder of tough synthetic rubber that completely separates the nitrogen precharge from the hydraulic fluid. There's no way for the gas to mix with the fluid. The bottle is precharged with nitrogen through a valve at one. At two is the port through which is pumped hydraulic fluid. The fluid also leaves the bottle from this port. Three is a poppet valve that closes the port when the bladder pushes against it. Four is an O-ring integral safety relief. It will relieve the pressure below the 12,000 PSI burst pressure of the vessel. Let's take a closer look at bottle-shaped accumulators with bladders. At left is a bladder that is shaped like a tapered cigar. It has this shape when there's no pressure on it. The tapered shape is important because it gives a pushing or squeeze action when fluid is discharging. 
Next, a thousand pounds of nitrogen precharge pushes the elastic bladder to the bottom and closes the poppet valve to prevent the bladder from being pushed into the port opening. Next, hydraulic fluid is pumped into the bottle and the 1200 PSI minimum pressure is reached quickly. At far right, the bottle is fully charged with fluid to 3000 PSI working pressure. Usually, a large number of bottles are used for safety. Just like a multi-engine airplane in which the other engines continue working even if one fails, several bottles provide safety in numbers. These bottles are totally safe. They cannot be disassembled under pressure, but they can be repaired in the field. The field replacement of the bladder is easy and can be done in an hour or so. After repair, the bottle still retains its Coast Guard or ASME approval. You can see the tops of bottles on the back of this particular unit. This unit is, of course, just one of many brands of accumulator units. However, all accumulators work on the same principle, so what is said here pretty well holds for all types of units. To see where the accumulator unit fits into the overall scheme, note this recommended installation. The accumulator unit is in the left foreground. Hydraulic fluid from the bottles flows through lines to the blowout preventer stack, where it operates the rams. The accumulator is located about 100 to 150 feet away from the rig, so that if a blowout occurs, the unit won't be damaged. The unit's operation can be controlled from the unit itself, but most often it is controlled from a master control panel near the driller's position. A unit can also be controlled from an auxiliary control panel, which is normally air operated, except in extremely cold areas. Where it's cold, electric panels are used, so that there's no possibility of water freeze up in air lines. This schematic of an entire accumulator unit shows the bottles at upper left. These are the bottles that store the fluid under pressure for operating the preventers. The question now is, how does the fluid get there? To keep from getting confused, let's look at the unit in four principal areas. Toward the lower right, you see area one, which is the air components. To the left is area two, showing the electrical components. At upper left is area three, showing the accumulator bottles. Area four shows the operating manifolds. In area one is the air components. The electricity is off. Air is stored in receiver tanks to run the pumps. There are three air pumps here, but on some there are only one or two. It's always nice to have more than one in case one fails. The pumps pick up fluid from the fluid reservoir and pump it to the bottles. Let's see how this takes place. To the right, rig air is tied into the system. Rig air is shown in blue. The air flows into the system through a strainer and then through a lubricator, which puts oil into the air to lubricate the pumps. The bypass valve can be opened so that rig air under full pressure can be sent directly to the pumps. Ordinarily, this valve is closed. Normally, the air goes through the automatic switch. Then the air flows through a valve manifold where air can be cut off to each pump. Finally, air flows to each pump. Hydraulic fluid is stored under atmospheric pressure in the tank. Fluid at atmospheric pressure is shown in yellow. The pumps take fluid out of the tank and pressure it up. Note that strainers are installed on the suction lines. The red lines indicate hydraulic fluid under 3,000 PSI pressure. The direction of flow is to the left, where it eventually reaches the accumulator bottles. But first, notice that high pressure fluid is also piped to the top of the pressure switch at right. When the pressure reaches a predetermined setting of 3,000 PSI, the switch automatically shuts off the pumps. If it's ever necessary to remove a pump from the system, all you do is shut off the air to that pump, and the pump is removed without disrupting the operation of the unit. The check valve below and to the left of the pumps prevents fluid from flowing backward and leaving the system. Air pumps are normally either a 50 to 1 ratio or a 60 to 1 ratio.
A 50 to 1 ratio means that for each 1 PSI of air pressure supplied to the pump, the pump delivers 50 PSI of hydraulic pressure. Put another way, if 100 PSI of rig air is supplied, then the pump delivers 5,000 PSI. The trend now is to use 60 to 1 pumps because they have larger capacity and deliver the necessary working pressure for the accumulator in a much shorter time than a 50 to 1 pump. The electrical pump is similar to the air pump. The yellow suction line at left leads from the tank to a cutoff valve through a strainer and on into the chain driven electric triplex pump. It is chain driven because chain drive is more reliable and safer than belt drive. The red is fluid under pressure and leaves the pump, passes through a check valve, and onward to the bottles. A pressure switch starts and stops the electric starter, cutting it off at about 3,000 PSI and cutting it back in at about 2,700 PSI, just like the air pump switch. A starter is used to start the electric motor. A pressure decrease is sensed by the pressure switch, which engages the starter, which in turn activates the motor. Once the fluid is pressured up, either by the air pump or electric pump, it flows through high pressure lines toward the bottles. First it passes through an optional rig skid and test valve at far left that is used on offshore platforms and jack-up rigs. It is used only when high pressure hydraulic fluid is needed for rig skidding or high pressure testing. On the other hand, this valve is very important. It's the accumulator shutoff valve. It's closed only when the rig is skidded or high pressure testing is being performed. If this valve is closed, stored fluid cannot be used to operate the preventers. Consequently, it's very important that this valve remain open when the unit is in use. With the valve open, the fluid enters the bank of bottles until they are pressured up to 3,000 PSI. When this pressure is reached, the air pumps and electric pump are automatically shut off by the pressure switches. The accumulator is protected by this relief valve that is set to pop or relieve at about 3,500 PSI. Should it pop, the fluid is piped through the yellow line back to the fluid tank. A pressure transmitter sends accumulator pressure readings to the control panels. Also tied into this line, is a direct reading pressure gauge. Now let's look at the control manifolds. Usually a dual manifold is used with each having its own pressure regulation. One manifold comes directly from the accumulator bank and is specifically for control of the annular preventer. The other manifold is for the rams and the choke and kill valves. Looking at the control manifold for the annular preventer, again notice the shutoff valve. This valve must be open during drilling operations. The manifold pipes the fluid to the strainer and into a pressure reducing and regulating valve that is air operated. The pressure drops from 3000 to 1500 PSI as it goes through the valve. This is indicated by the color change from red to orange. On most new equipment, the regulator can be operated remotely from the driller's control panel. The valve is not only a regulator, but is a pressure reducing valve as well. When the fluid from the accumulator bottles comes through this valve, the fluid pressure is regulated to the valve setting, maintaining a constant pressure downstream. Here drilling fluid is seeping between the drill pipe and packing unit of the closed annular preventer. This points out that after the 1500 PSI closing pressure closes the preventer, the pressure reducing and regulating valve should be adjusted to reduce the closing pressure to some value below 1500 PSI. Reduce the closing pressure just enough to allow seepage. The seepage lubricates the packing unit to give it longer service life as the drill stem is moved through it. As the tool joint forces the rubber element open, the fluid pressure on the closed side of the preventer increases. The valve senses this increase and dumps some of the fluid through the yellow line back to the fluid reservoir. As the tool joint leaves the preventer, there is a decrease in pressure on the closed side 
and the valve correctly compensates. Other components of the annular preventer manifold are the four-way control valve, bottom right, the pressure gauge, right, and a relief valve at left. One more important valve on this manifold is this one. When this accumulator bleeder valve is open, all the hydraulic fluid is bled from the bottles into the reservoir. This is for moves. Normally the valve should be closed. Sometimes when a man forgets to close this valve, he wonders why he can't get accumulator pressure built back up. Of course, the problem is that all the fluid is just circulating back into the tank. This is the manifold that supplies fluid pressure to the four-way valves controlling the ram preventers and the choke and kill valves. Under normal conditions, in order to prevent excessive wear on the elements within the preventers, the fluid pressure is reduced by the regulator from 3,000 psi to 1,500 psi. However, under blowout conditions, or when extremely high well pressures are encountered, it may be necessary to apply the full 3,000 psi to the rams. By opening this bypass valve, a full 3,000 psi flows to the four-way valves and onto the preventer. This high energy availability assures fast positive closing of the preventers to prevent damage or wear to the rams from sand or high pressure gas blowing through the annulus. When a full 3,000 psi of fluid is applied to the manifold, the regulator doesn't feel the pressure increase because of the check valve. The pressure gauge on the manifold shows the pressure being applied. When the preventers are operated, the accumulator pressure drops, and this drop automatically starts the pumps. Now let's look at some do's and don'ts about maintenance. Maintenance, of course, varies from rig to rig because some operators use and test the equipment frequently, while others do so only rarely. As a rule of thumb, check the components at least every 30 days until you can establish a maintenance program that fits your use. The air strainer element, where rig air enters the accumulator, should be removed and thoroughly washed. The air lubricator should be kept filled with a light 10-weight oil. Check the pump packings. Keep them tight enough so that the pump plunger packing doesn't drip, yet loose enough so that both the plunger and packing receive some lubrication. But don't over-tighten the packing because you'll overload the motor and burn the packing. The suction strainer that filters the fluid for both the air and electric pumps should be removed and washed. The oil bath for the chain and sprocket drive on the electric pump should be kept full of heavyweight oil. Occasionally, remove the bottom drain plug to drain any water that may have accumulated there. The fluid tank or reservoir should have the proper amount of good, clean, lightweight hydraulic fluid in it. Do not use fuel oil or water. A good fluid is K50 that can be diluted with water. There are two high pressure strainers in the hydraulic fluid lines. Their elements should be taken out and washed thoroughly. Remember that each of the four way valves need lubricating. There's a grease fitting on the mounting bracket and an oil cup for the piston rod. Both need regular attention. The nitrogen gas precharge to the accumulator bottles should be checked. Accumulators of this type using bladders to separate gas from liquid should be checked after each well, and the pressure should read from 1,000 to 1,300 psi. Ball accumulators that have no separation between the nitrogen precharge and the fluid should definitely be checked every three to four weeks. Remember, when you lose nitrogen pressure, you lose usable fluid. Let's also mention once more that gas precharge must be nitrogen, not oxygen. And one more don't to re-emphasize. Never leave the shutoff valve to the accumulator bank closed during drilling operations. It must be open in order for the control system to work. When electrical connectors are used, there are two more do's and don'ts to mention. 
always properly align the electrical hose connectors before joining them to prevent shorting. Use the dots or aligning marks as guides. Keep unattached connectors covered by caps to keep water and dirt out of the lines. Don't leave an electrical cable lying in a path or roadway where they can be run over and don't hang them over sharp edges or bend them around a sharp corner. Don't hurry when hooking up a cable from the panel to the unit. This is sensitive electrical equipment and should be handled properly. One final point. Sizing of a blowout preventer control system is very important. Unfortunately, there is an awful lot of confusion surrounding what is really a very easy thing to determine. You'll hear talk about such things as sequencing. Close all the rams, open once, close again, and get the volume required. Boyle's Law, Charles Law, Pascal's Law, and so on and so forth. But here's all you really need to do. Find the total number of gallons of fluid required to close the annular and all the rams. Multiply this by three, and you have the volume required. And this calculation includes a 50% safety factor. The volumes required to close the annular and rams are available from the manufacturer. As an example, let's say that the annular preventer requires 17.98 gallons to close, and that three rams require a total of 17.4. These two figures total 35.38 gallons. And multiplying by three, comes out to 106.14 gallons. Since accumulators are generally sized in 10-gallon units, specify a 110-gallon unit. That's all there is to it. We know that these few minutes haven't made you an all-around expert in the operation and repair of accumulator units, but we also know that you've picked up some good information. If nothing else, you now know how to size an accumulator, and that alone puts you way ahead of most people. And keep this in mind. If you're in drilling, it's just a matter of time. Sooner or later, your blowout preventer controls will be the best friend you've got.